All right, so I'm gonna just kind of build on what, um, what we just heard and talk about uh, a little bit more um, accelerating through the data collection and um, uh, what the future looks like. Uh, my disclosure is I, I teach and do um, training for almost all the companies that um, have artificial cervical discs. And um, we'll run into some of our uh, better outcomes. So what's the FDA status uh, as of now? So I kind of break this up generationally. Um, the legacy discs are the ones that were started in the early part of the year 2000. So it was the, uh, the Prestige, the ProDisc C, and the Bryan. Um, all were FDA approved before uh, 2010. Um, 2012, the Secure C and the PCM were FDA approved and entered the market. 2013, uh, Moby hit a home run with uh, both one and two level approvals in the same year. And Kineflex C, which was a metal on metal disc, went all the way through its um, data collection to the, uh, the eve of FDA panel and then was withdrawn because it was a metal metal disc. And metal metal was getting a black eye at that time on uh, hip replacements. So that uh, never made it through. In 2014, uh, Prestige LP was approved for a single level and the M6 started a disc that had been uh, sold commercially outside the US, uh, started an IDE study here. 2016, uh, Simplified This started its one level study and Prestige LP two level was approved. And then in 2017, the Simplify two level study started and M6 was approved for single level in 2019. So that kind of takes you through. And a couple of these discs have fallen off, um, but the, uh, uh, it's a pretty rich uh, market and um, there's a lot of uh, competition in a lot of discs and a lot of data because of that. So as a result of all these FDA studies, there's been a lot of good level one data that's been published by um, looking at the, uh, the FDA database. So two year data is published on almost everything and then five year, seven year and just uh, recently last spring, uh, Prestige, LP, both one and two, uh, two level 10 year data was published. Uh, so that's part of the, um, the scientific database now. And if you look at this, um, a number of scientific publications just in arthroplasty. So the dark blues are lumbar. I'll come back to that in my lumbar talk but um, looking at the red bars, those are the cervical papers, and you can see that it's just you know, increasing uh, um, almost logarithmically as far as interest and um, scientific study of the information that's been generated in these multi-center prospective randomized uh, trials. Um, also, insurance penetration for the uh, cervical arthroplasty devices has been really good. So this is the percent of um, Americans with indemnity insurance who have access to cervical disc replacement. So of 330 million Americans, about 200 million have commercial insurance. The rest either have no insurance or federally um, uh, funded insurance, either through the military or for Medicare. They are not in this. Uh, but of the 200 million people who do, you can see that um, one level uh, uh, and two level both at this point are about 95% um, who have insurance plans that will approve cervical disc replacement. I'll show you that uh, in the lumbar talk how different that is. But it's given us this huge wealth of information. It's good all level one scientific uh, data. It's the best that we can do. It um, takes as much of the bias out of an individual doctor reporting or an individual institution reporting their results. These are blended multi-center trials, even to the point where you can put together many of those trials into a meta-analysis, which is really the highest level that we can do. So I'll give you the executive summary looking at um, outcomes, at durability, of results, of reoperation rates, um, as we uh, looked at just for a second before, adjacent segment degeneration, and then just a, a few slides on two level studies. So the bottom line on the outcomes are that um, in every single study, uh, the, the arthroplasty patients uh, are, are no worse. Um, in some studies, they do uh, statistically superiorly to uh, uh, arthrodesis patients, but there's no study where disc replacements do worse than ACDFs, which we've all kind of grown up with as our you know, basic standard of care. Um, so that's a lot of patients now, a lot of patients, a lot of studies over a long period of time, and in no study do uh, arthroplasty patients do worse. And in fact, in some, on some measures, they do statistically superiorly. Um, outcomes are consistent across all studies. There's really no study that shows that any one device is uh, dramatically superior to another um, or any study that shows that there's a huge divergence between uh, disc replacement and um, 
uh, and uh, ACDF, looking at um, NDI, looking at VAS, looking at patient satisfaction, which I think are three important markers for us, predominantly because they are patient generated. These are patient generated outcomes. This is not asking the surgeon, um, did your patient have a good, fair, excellent you know, re result, the, the old criteria, which was always suspect because you know we're kind of bi biased. We always want our patients to do well, and they want to tell us they're doing well. Um, so those things where the surgeons interpreting it are always a little suspect, whereas these are um, just patients filling out forms at every single visit. Reoperation rates I'll come back to as a separate um, little uh, section because it's so important, but uh, reoperation rates are always lower um, and significantly so, sometimes by uh, two to three to five times lower in patients who have randomly gotten a disc replacement rather than an ACDF, very sobering statistic. Um, this is a, a paper we gave at ISAS, and uh, Donna Anmis, our, our researcher, pulled out the NDI scores. NDI is the only um, exactly the same marker in every single one of the IDE studies. There's always a, a, a little bit of a difference in other ones, even like VAS. Some of the um, ID studies, the VAS is, what's the worst pain you're having today? Other ones, what's the worst pain you've had this month? Other is, what's the worst pain you've ever had? So you can't even take a VAS and, and pool them. But you can pool an NDI. It's exactly the same instrument that every company has used. And if you see the improvements in these multiple disc replacements and their controls, and their ACDF controls, um, you can see it's a very rewardingly um, uh, uh, satisfactory um, surgery because these patients report that their impairment is significantly less uniformly. You get this same hockey stick look. And this was 24 month data. Now we've followed these patients out for five years, seven years, and 10 years, and these lines don't change. So um, when uh, the state of Washington, for example, um, uh, said that there is, they're going to stop reimbursing for ACDFs because there's no literature that shows that surgery does any better for cervical radiculopathy. This data was available, and this data helped reverse that decision. So that's how you fight you know, stupid um, decisions. Finally, we have data. Um, one of my favorite meta-analyses was an older one, and this was done using the three legacy disks by you know, some, some pretty respectable um, authors. And they pooled um, about 1,200 patients from the original Prestige ST, the Brian and the ProDisc C studies, um, with 24-month follow-up, um, pretty good uh, percentages of follow-up, and a pretty high union rate in the control patients. So it's not like the control patients were doing badly because they didn't uh, fuse. And um, their uh, um, conclusions were there were no significant differences in NDI SF36 or pain among the different uh, legacy implants, that in general the TDR patients had significantly better neurologic success. And we've kind of debated this back and forth. We think we probably did a better decompression in the patients that we were going to put a disc in um, than the patients that we were going to fuse, because in the fusion patients we were sort of relying on the stability and the indirect decompression, whereas uh, putting a motion device in, we were consciously doing a better decompression. I think most surgeons will admit that. Um, but also the significantly lower reoperation rate, which we'll come back to. So that was a small, relatively small study from eight years ago. Here's a huge study by the Chinese Orthopedic Association published just last year um, of a meta-analysis of 21 studies with over 4,000 patients. And they only included randomized control trials um, with follow-ups of at least 18 months, some of them out to 10 years. Uh, and they found, again, that the arthroplasty patients in these huge groups, and you know, meta-analysis is pooling all this patient data and applying different statistical tools to it. Uh, but when you do that, that the reoperation rates are um, at least uh, half as, as much at the index level, um, almost half as much in the adjacent level, and half again when you pool the two levels in patients who um, randomly assigned artificial disc replacement then fusion. So this is a you know kind of a, a wake up call for many of us who thought ACDF was such a good operation that there's no way you could make it better. But here's a way that consistently it's better than um, than an ACDF to the point where if it was your brother um, and he you know 20 years ago he said should I have one of these new artificial discs or an ACDF for my single level disease. You tell them have an ACDF, it's the best thing we do. But now, you know, looking at this kind of data, you might tell them something different um, if you're concerned about reoperation rate. Well, how about durability or longevity of results? Um, what we found out in all these FDA studies, both for cervical and lumbar, is that what you get at six months is generally what you get. 
uh, for, for ten, you know, 10 years, uh, as you can see here, because again, we followed these same patient cohorts out for five years and seven years, um, and even some at 10 years, and the data remains stable. And these are the two 10-year publications uh, that uh, Prestige um, LP1 and 2 level published last spring in the Journal of Neurosurgery. So, um, it, you know, even to the point where, you know, it'd be nice if we get the FDA to shorten that two-year time for primary IDE studies, uh, which was really born out of fusions because they were, you had to wait two years before you could declare something fused or not. Well, now that we, we're not uh, controlling against fusions anymore, it would be nice to get a shorter time to get a determination and then just a long time of post-market surveillance. I think that wouldn't be a disservice to patients. It would certainly stimulate a little bit more um, innovation. Uh, companies would be more willing to do studies if they didn't have to pay for a two-year follow-up since the data analysis is really right there at six months to a year. Um, looking at the uh, Proteus seven-year study, which is a study that uh, Mike Han showed uh, came out of our uh, publications group, uh, was one of the first studies that uh, used an independent biostatistician. So we did not use the, the uh, company um, biostatisticians. There's nothing wrong with that because that data is going through the FDA and they're combing through it. So no company in their right mind is going to fudge that data and then have the FDA um, go through it and find out that they did something wrong. So the, the data is okay. But for the first time here, we took that raw data and um, uh, used an external statistician to analyze it. So we had a pretty high follow-up rate for a seven-year study, about 80%. Um, and here was our NDI curve, and you can see you know, about a 60% improvement uh, by six months that continues out to seven years in both groups, in both uh, arthroplasty and the ACDF groups. And the same thing with uh, VAS for pain. You can see there's a dramatic improvement in patients' radicular arm pain, which is great because that's why they're coming to us. That's you know what the, that's the result they're expecting to get. And you can see it hits you know rock bottom and stays there out to seven years, whether you do an ACDF or an artificial disc. So um, it's a very gratifying surgery for patients who have failed conservative treatment. Uh, if we come to look at the reoperation rates, these are secondary surgery rates, again, in every single study favor disc replacement. And if you look at here's a variety of studies, and you can see that the, the delta is, it's a multiple. It's, you know, two to three times less secondary surgeries in the randomized ADR patients than it is in the ACDF patients. And if we just look at the, uh, the really old man studies, the longer term studies uh, that went out to seven and 10 years, you can see that that multiple stays about the same. It's about a two to three X difference in patients who were um, randomly assigned. They were exactly the same pool of patients. They some randomized to a disc replacement, some randomized to a fusion. And then you follow those guys out for seven years and you can see um, that so many fewer required secondary surgeries. Looking at adjacent segment degeneration, a lot of uh, literature, some of this came from um, Europe, but uh, so you see different uh, numbers and there's different ways for determining um, uh, fusions in some of them too, but you can see the radiographic adjacent level uh, surgeries, um, a radi I'm sorry, radiographic adjacent level degeneration is always much less in the uh, patients who receive an artificial disc. In our US IDE studies, Dom Korek uh, presented this, uh, or published in neurosurgery uh, spine, he presented, I think at CSRS, and he showed that preoperatively, um, is this that little circle you were using? Yeah, yeah. preoperatively, the amount of uh, severe and moderate degenerative disease um, was not much different between the groups, but if you looked at them at two years, now in the ACDF group, a lot more had severe and moderate adjacent level degeneration measured by the radiologist than the, uh, the arthroplasty patients. Um, and Mike Heise presented this at NAS. This was using the MOBI-C database, looking at adjacent segment degeneration, um, using a Kelgren-Lawrence scale. That's a, um, a validated radiographic scale that's easy for the radiologist. It's got pictures and, and uh, little descriptors um, so that there is very good inter-observer uh, agreement when the radiologists rate that. And you can see here also that at 24 months, there was a huge difference in adjacent segment um, radiographic changes between the two groups. Jeff Spivak showed some of the data from the uh, Proteus C study uh, at CSRS in 2012. And what Jeff showed is that ACDFs um, had about 78% uh, had adjacent segment degeneration uh, radiographically, whereas both a randomized um, and a non-randomized sample of arthroplasty patients had almost uh, half that, or at least uh, two-thirds of that amount of degeneration. 
Jeff went on to give another paper from our publications group, and this was at CSRS in December of 2015, and um, he was able to slice or peel the onion a little bit uh, deeper, get a little more granularity. This is that kelgren lorentz scale, and this is why the radiologists like it and why it's validated, uh, because it's pretty clear on how you can rate um, adjacent level disease. Oh, degeneration. So here's what Jeff showed, and for the first time, he was able to show that um, depending on how many degrees of range of motion we were able to give back to a patient at their five-year follow-up in this, uh, this paper, actually seven-year uh, follow-up, if we gave them more motion, they had um, less adjacent level degeneration radiographically. Only 43% if we gave them more than seven degrees. Um, 53% if they got between four and six, and if we did a crappy job, if we only gave them zero to three, they essentially had the same adjacent level degeneration as a patient who had an ACDF. Remember, that was 78, this is 76. So it was the first time that we were able to show that, um, that if we can do a better job giving motion, motion is progressively protective of adjacent level degeneration radiographically, whether that will translate to an improvement in adjacent level disease is a, a leap that we still haven't been able to bridge, but we know the reoperation rates are less. So uh, in theory, we can um, attach those, although we don't have the direct study to do that. So just a little bit about um, two-level disc replacement. Uh, there are two uh, devices that currently have FDA approval for two-level use, and that's the MOBI-C that got that approval in 2013, and the Prestige LP that got it in 2016. Um, Simplify is um, uh, ongoing with a trial for two-level, and uh, well, should have uh, hopefully FDA approval in, in within a year or two, but um, it's still in uh, data collection. In the Prestige LP study, it was a big study. Medtronic uh, is known for doing big studies, 30 centers, prospective randomized. Um, they did one and two level concurrent studies of their two discs. 456 were in the uh, two level randomized study. That was uh, one to one randomized to ACDFs. Uh, it was designed as a non-inferiority study, but with that number of patients, it was powered to pr uh, show statistical superiority if the numbers came up. Um, multiple follow-up data points, as in every one of these FDA studies, their enrollment ended in 2007. It took a while to get through FDA approval. Um, it's a metal composite, so they had to go through some extra hoops also because there are some increased uh, metal ions that result from this, but they're uh, lower than patients, for example, who have uh, rods and screws. So they were ultimately able to get uh, uh, past the FDA objections to that, and they got their approval in 2016. And um, their point be, is that uh, compared to the ACDF, they showed uh, a significant overall success at each of their data points now out to uh, 84 months. Todd Landman uh, published their seven-year conclusions and showed that the two-level study, they maintained clinical outcomes, maintained segmental motion, um, were non-inferior to ACDF in all measures. They were superior in their overall composite success uh, outcome at seven years and had a lower rate of secondary surgeries. Matt Gornat followed those patients out for three more years, and he's the one that published the 10-year paper last spring. Um, he showed statistical superiority in, again, that composite overall success formula at 10 years. Uh, he followed them out for grade four or bridging HO, heterotopic ospication, and it was about 8%. Uh, 8%. And that's kind of what we see in all the studies. It's about a percent a year, and, and by seven to 10 years, it's usually in the uh, seven to 10% to of patients who will get bridging HO. And I don't think that's device specific. I think it's uh, either technique or physiologically specific to the cervical spine. Um, so, you know, the glass is half empty or half full. You can, some people can say, yeah, why well, do that operation when 10% of people are fused in 10 years? The flip side is, but 90% of people are still moving. And even the 10% who are fused have the same outcome as an ACDF, which is pretty damn good. So, um, you know, we've got the data to prove that too. Um, the MOBI-C was also a, a multi-center study. They ran also concurrent one and two level studies. They had 330 patients in their two level study. Uh, randomized to ACDF, also multiple data points, uh, FDA approval for two level in 2013. Um, and they were able to show that uh, at, at every data point, the patients who received a two level MOBI-C were better off than a patients who received a two level um, ACDF. And um, they showed superiority, actually, uh, in, in overall study success. Again, that composite formula at 84 months. Um, 
they showed earlier higher success, uh, higher early success rates, I'm sorry, and again, lower uh, degeneration. Um, these are good bar graphs, because I think what these show is that one-level cervical disc disease is different than two-level cervical disc disease, that results of a one-level ACDF are pretty close to a one-level arthroplasty, but a two-level ACDF is a more disabling operation than a two-level disc replacement is. You know, we've all kind of always thought that, yeah, one and two levels do the same, um, but actually they were nice enough to give me the control database. We actually published a paper um, just looking at ACDFs one and two level with now this nice prospectively collected long-term data um, that showed that two-level disease and two-level ACDFs uh, are different than one. The patients are more disabled going in and they don't make the same kind of recovery after a two-level ACDF than they do as a one. So we, we, we were kind of fooling ourselves uh, for a while. So what's next on the horizon? There are mechanical um, changes coming. There are new materials coming. There's improved imaging coming um, and some new designs of uh, some old friends. So um, from a mechanical standpoint, the M6 has uh, that extra axial compression and also a, uh, an elastic progressive resistance to torsion, uh, more of a viscoelastic response. Um, you can see the hysteresis curve. Uh, Dr. Pat Warden does this at Loyola. And the, the um, resistance to uh, ranges of motion is almost identical and overlays uh, that of a normal disc. As far as new materials, the um, Simplify is a peak on ceramic. It's the first time we've seen that articulating couple um, in a disc replacement. And um, it will lead to uh, some improved imaging, as um, we saw in the last talk. Uh, ProDisc C has been using some different uh, designs outside the U.S., and they're about to start uh, studies, a uh, two-level study, actually, uh, where the ProDisc C with a shorter keel and the ProDisc uh, C Vivo, which is um, a convex, uh, more anatomic superior end plate and spikes, uh, will be used against the two-level Moby C. And in, in, what's unique about the study is the surgeons get to choose which of these new designs, and they can even mix and match them to patient anatomy in the same patient. So it'll be kind of interesting to see um, how that evolves with prospectively collected data. So looking at the M6, it, you know, its um, goal was to try to reproduce uh, what, uh, what nature did, you know, giving us uh, a somewhat uh, elastic nucleus and a uh, annulus, and it uses these interwoven um, uh, fibers, ultra high molecular polyethylene fibers that crisscross at similar angles and give that nice hysteresis curve that you saw from uh, Dr. Pat Warden's lab uh, to combine that with relatively uh, easy implantation, but it gives that the ability to do flexion extension, lateral bend, torsion, and uh, resist some axial compression all on the same disc. So the quality of motion uh, becomes much more physiologic than um, some of the other uh, older designs that we've used that have good clinical outcomes, um, but this one looks like it has more of a physiologic natural uh, range of motion. And the uh, um, implantation is pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of show that in the lab, and I think we'll do a demo on one. Um, but it's just uh, uh, two sizes with uh, extra depth components to each one and fairly straightforward implantation steps. And uh, their study showed safety and effectiveness. At two years, uh, patients had better um, uh, pain, better function, better quality of life scores, maintenance of motion at the implanted level, uh, significant decrease in opioid use. It was like a huge difference in opioid use at two years and uh, lower secondary surgery, uh, as you would think. So uh, less uh, length of time in surgery and a shorter hospital time as well. And here was the pain medication use. You can see it's a seven times greater reduction in opioid use. Um, looking at the simplified disc, it's a pretty um, looking disc. You can see it's kind of uh, unique. It has the, uh, the little peak uh, pellet and then uh, ceramic end plates with a little light uh, titanium coat for um, bone healing. It has a little retaining ring built into the upper end plate to uh, keep the core in place. And it makes an interesting looking x-ray. Yeah, really kind of neat x-rays, um, very nice motion. Um, these patients are doing really well in our uh, study site, in our hands. And the imaging is spectacular. Um, even on the axial, you can see into the foramen really well, which is always the tough part for us. 
um, with uh, cobalt chrome implants where if we're really worried about the frame and we have to get a Milo CT, but here you can you know, see the quality uh, is, is exceptionally good. Yep. Did I jump, jump the gun? Yeah, there it is. Um, M6 also has titanium end plates, um, which give improved imaging. So you can see side by side between the Simplify and the M6, um, as opposed to some of the other designs that we have that just have a little bit more metal in them. Um, we always tell patients we can, you know, they say, can I get an MRI afterwards? Yeah, you can get an MRI, and we can tell a lot about Jason levels. We just lose a little bit at that level. And if we ever have to look a little closer, then, then we have to get a myelogram CT scan. Uh, the Prodis C, as I mentioned, is um, uh, using some of the models that were used outside the U.S. Um, their strategy uh, is to try to give the surgeons a few more options, depending on patient's um, anatomy, and not just have to stick to one design. And also to help us expand our use of devices into um, two-level use, and maybe ultimately into a hybrid use. You can see the, the differences between the standard ProDisc, the shorter keel one. Uh, there's a ProDisc Nova that may be tested at a later time. That's a, a once a keel on top, two on the bottom for doing multiple levels for those people who are concerned about putting stress points all in the same uh, line. Uh, and then the ProDisc Vivo, which is the one that has a more anatomic convex uh, upper end plate and spikes. So you can see the difference in the short keel design for the, uh, the ProDisc SK. So that two-level studies uh, 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 actually began already. Somebody's already done some implantations, and other study sites are, are quickly rolling up. So the executive summary is, uh, you know, there's just a huge amount of really strong level 1B, which is the, uh, pro the randomized control trials at individual institutions, and 1A data, which is the meta-analysis combining all those things, that clearly shows that arthroplasty will reduce or delay adjacent segment degeneration um, and has a significantly lower uh, reoperation rate. So adjacent segment disease is also positively affected by arthroplasty. Uh, there's no data suggesting in, in any of these studies that, it, that arthroplasty is worse than an ACDF. Um, and now we've got this strong data out to 10 years. Uh, so you know, we're pretty stoked about it. Um, you know, less radiographic ADL, strong trend that motion is protective against uh, adjacent segment progression. Motion is statistically protective against particularly severe and moderately severe disease. Uh, and in two-level patients, we think it's even more of a, uh, of a godsend than, uh, than single level. So all that stuff is pretty undisputed looking at the data. Um, that's it, guys. You know, that's about as strong as uh, stuff as we can get. So thank you. Jack, as always, fantastic. Um, I want to point out something to the audience that need not be pointed out, but you and Mike Jansen and a couple of others have really deserved amazing kudos for having changed the whole perception and the game for spine surgery. Uh, I remember well in our state when we were attacked and uh, Trent uh, Treadway and I were the only ones standing down there trying to fight against um, the attempts at our state to try to legislate spine surgery into really unacceptable medieval uh, uh, standards. And uh, it was you and others who had provided data and who actually physically came out and showed your data that really just provided an unparalleled um, uh, kind of a reality. And I well remember the chairman, whose name shall not be repeated here and need not be repeated, um, who basically said that spine surgery set the trend for other specialties to follow. And this is kudos to you and Mike. And I want to point out Neil Sean, who's here also, who partook in that uh, battle. So this needs to be said. One big question that emerges now as disc arthroplasties have left the realm of efficiency testing in the hands of masters like you guys and has uh, gone into the a general realm of efficiencies, meaning everybody gets to do it. Has there been a difference of complication rates in the hands of commoners like myself versus the, uh, the highfalutin superstars uh, of the field? Oh my God, wait, let me shove on a little bit. Um, 
I mean, the good news is that these studies were the learning curve for everybody who was in it. So these, I think these FDA studies that we've been following so religiously and, and praying over really are the worst case scenario. I think you know, that, that put um, the, the investigative surgeons in the same pot as anybody else without the benefit of training. I mean, you know, without the benefit of having a course and a cadaver lab and everything else. So uh, we have not seen that happen in, in cervical disc replacement. Um, and I'm very comfortable saying that you should anticipate these results or better um, in your patients. And I think time has really shown that. Uh, there are complications with cervical disc replacement as there are with anything else, but the denominators are so big and the complication rates are so small that we're pretty comfortable that these are worst case scenarios. Let me follow it up with one more question. The suboptimal patient. So uh, these were, again, all very cleansed, motivated patients. And I have a common thing now in my clinic where we still have a lot of smokers in our state. And they come to me and they have a rotten disc and they've seen a couple of surgeons and they've all been told the same thing, don't smoke or I won't operate on you, which I think is a very applaudable thing. But these patients come to me and go like, we know you do disc arthroplasties and we don't have to stop smoking if you have disc arthroplasty. So what do you tell patients who smoke? Do they have to stop smoking before they get a disc arthroplasty or not? Um, I'm not a, uh, a very rigid about it because in the studies there were small numbers of smokers um, whose outcomes were the same as the non-smokers. So I, I don't have a good data reason to tell them that they have to stop smoking. I discourage them from pulmonary and medical reasons, um, but they don't all stop and I don't make them stop. We have not seen outcome issues. But in general, you know, for certainly for fusion patients, I try to get them to stop. With my arthroplasties, I'm a little less rigid about it. Yes. Um, oh yeah, just, just push the button at the bottom. Oh. Uh, Christoph Hofstede from the University of Washington. That was a great talk. Really, really enjoyed it, especially the long-term data. I have a question for you. Um, how do you, uh, you know, given that we have all these implants available right now, do you fine-tune them and do you, do you see that certain discs work better for certain patients, in particular uh, considering the some of them are more restrained? Also with the M6 now coming to the market that has a more physiological motion, do you, how do you select now within your patient population who want to do this procedure, the appropriate disc? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think we're just kind of scratching the surface of, of trying to figure out whether some discs are better for, for some conditions. So I, you know, I'm comfortable using two or three different models. So like most surgeons, I like to stay within my comfort zone. Um, and every once in a while, I'll venture out. But usually, I stay where I, I know how to the workarounds. But within that comfort zone, also, I look at the patient's anatomy. Um, I look at their flexibility. Um, and, and as you alluded to, if someone has a very hypermobile neck, I might use a more constrained implant than if somebody has a stiffer neck. Um, if I'm worried about uh, uh, osteopenia, I might worry about different kinds of fixation uh, to the bone. So try to add all those things up in the equation that goes to the patient. But scientifically, I don't have a real good um, answer. And I keep trying to chip away like at the biomechanical engineers to, to help us um, whether decide whether there are certain implants that are better and what parameters we should use. So I, it's a very astute question. But I don't have a great answer for you. Yes. Uh, Jack Neal Shawnard, uh, when you have such high performance of so many of these implants, how can an M6 discern and separate itself uh, with even more superior outcomes? Yeah, you know, I think time will tell as you follow it. We have good um, two-year outcomes data for it, and they are committed now to follow for seven to 10 years. So we're going to have five-year data points, seven-year data points, 10-year data points. I think we just have to, to see how it does over time. Um, but certainly the early two-year data and, and a large OUS data uh, database that it goes on for much longer, but is not as um, full as the U.S. database is, uh, doesn't suggest that there are uh, going to be issues with it. They've got about almost 50,000 um, implants worldwide in uh, M6 already. Yes. Uh, Vayner Namani, uh, uh, Virginia Mason. Really great talk. I really enjoyed it. My question is on... Um, what are your thoughts on this replacement for patients 
very collapsed disc or 10 degrees of kyphosis, if, uh, you know, are we able to push the implications of which patients uh, we need to do disc replacement over the place? Yeah, good question. I think you can push it a little bit. Um, in the FDA study, we were supposed to have excluded patients with a greater than 50% disc height loss, although that, that didn't always happen. My exclusions for now are fixed segmental kyphosis. I can't fix that with a motion machine. Um, bone on bone with a lot of bony disease where I'm going to have to do a lot of decompression, I tell them no, or patients who have no pre-op motion. If, they're, if that segment is moving as if it's fused, then as good a job as I do, um, they're not gonna have good motion after. So those are my personal ones, and they've kept me safe so far, and I've seen people who've gotten in trouble doing an excessive bony decompression and then having a subsidence afterwards, and that's a miserable result. ACDF is a really good option. We consent every patient for it, um, and I try to talk patients into it when I think it's the right thing. Last, last one, and then I'll give it. Yeah, Jack, excellent talk, by the way. Um, uh, with respect to insurance, if you have somebody with existing ACDF and you want to do adjacent uh, disc replacement, have you had any luck getting insurance approvals? Yeah, actually we have, particularly if it's a different insurance company, um, because uh, you know the insurance horizon is about 18 months. That's statistically that's how how frequently Americans change their insurance through their employer. So uh, a lot of times they don't have that data. So I, I'm just very circumspect in how I dictate my my. Uh, uh, office notes, um, and we have had surprisingly little trouble getting that approved. And sometimes even when it's the same one, if there's been several years in between, if you don't focus on the fact in your notes that they've got an arthroplasty um, and just say that they have this disease at this level, which is not a lie, it's just not <laughs> as inclusive as it could be, um, we've been able to get those, those through. Correct, right. Okay. All right, let me turn it over to Mike. Mike I'm chewing into his time. Jack. Sure, Mike. Anyway, um, if you have patients that have a, an ACDNF have a much higher incidence of adjacent level disease, have you seen the same trend on a patient that auto-fused a total disc that therefore over a certain period of time now the other disc goes back? So they should be similar to an ACDNF. Even though they're a small group of patients, early on we saw some that auto-fused and maybe it was too small of an implant or whatever the case may be. You would expect that they would behave the same then for the adjacent disease. Yeah, and I try to talk that patient out of another disc replacement because I think they're just a bone, they're a bone former. I mean, sure, it could have been technique, it could have been the, the original implantation, implanter, whether it was me or someone else. Um, but once you see that somebody forms really nice HO, I try to talk them out of that. Because I think, especially if they've subsided into a little bit of kyphosis, you have the opportunity now with an ACF to restore their sagittal alignment a little. And the fear is that if they drop a second one into kyphosis and, and HO across it, then they're really screwing up their mechanics for the rest of their neck. Can you get Dr. Jansen up there? Thanks, guys. Thanks.